in a historic move, the Supreme Court last month conferred the status of seniority to 11 women advocates practicing in the top court. These 11 women advocates were part of a list of 56 lawyers who were conferred with this honor. Today, out of these 11, we have four joining us in the studio of The Print. They are here to discuss about their journey in the field of law as a litigating lawyer and also to talk about whether this is the breaking of the glass ceiling moment for them or not. So I start from my right. Let me first introduce them to you. Uh, on my right is Liz Matthew, Uttara Babar, Swarupama Chaturvedi and Archana Pathak uh, Well, welcome all of you and many, many congratulations because this definitely was an achievement since all four of you underwent a great scrutiny which also involved, I think, um, an interview process before a board headed by the Chief Justice of India. So, um, we will start with your journey as in how it began. So let me start with you, Swarupama, since you have a unique uh, perspective in the sense that you switched over to litigation after spending a couple of years in academic. Why did you did so? So I'll take you back to the time when I did my law graduation. I was in Gorakhpur and my father was very upset with the idea that I wanted to be lawyer and wanted to go to litigation because for him, the women in district court was something he wasn't comfortable with. So I was given three options going for LLM or going for judiciary preparation or get married. <laughs> so I opted LLM as the best possible option. And then academia just happened to me because whatever I did, I just fell in love with. And while doing LLM academia was something which took over my mind. And to start with, when I got <clears throat> appointed to NLS Bangalore, it was something definitely a dream place to go but and work. So I continued and I at that time definitely did not have thought that I would ever leave NLSI or the kind of academic experience, exposure and work conditions I had. And then, uh, but becoming lawyer was always in mind. Hmm. It was a hidden desire, childhood dream, which made me to do my LLB was always there. And then at the time when I got my daughter and my husband was settled in Delhi, we had a talk what do you want to do? I mean, and then I felt that was the right time for me to think about my childhood dream again, while my daughter wasn't medically very comfortable in Bangalore. And I just took the, the plunge. Okay. I just decided, let me go back and try. So for how many years in academy and how many? Six uh, years, almost hmm. half and half in academia. Before that, I was doing PhD, which I dropped. And then I, when I came to litigation in Supreme Court, Supreme Court was my first choice in 2012 May. I resigned in NLS Bangalore and I came and Supreme Court became my first choice because I was teaching interpretation of statute over there. Mm -hmm. And while teaching, I had a different kind of fascination with how to play with words. And mm -hmm. I just felt that, you know, and that's where I was getting ready to come into litigation because I wanted to see that process which made that judgment coming out, which I read and I explain to students the interpretation law. You wanted to experience and witness exactly. it. Exactly. So hmm. my desire to come into litigation was enhancing day by day while I was doing interpretation, a reading for interpretation and reading judgments. Because many a times I would not agree with the outcome. Many a times I would feel, no, 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 this this wasn't the question of law. This should have been. Hmm. And I thought instead of sitting and criticizing before 80 people, why shouldn't I go and try if I can assist? So that's how and you... That's how the... You found a... in private life, my personal life, I thought that was an opportunity for me to relive my life, which I always wanted. That's great. And so, that's where I came. so since you, um, you, you were teaching in NLS, let me come to Liz and Uttara. Both of you have a background in the sense that you've spent your, uh, uh, your student life in, in, in the country's best, uh, law college. And it is often said that people with that kind of a background, opt or prefer to go into the corporate side. Why did both of you think of getting into litigation? What really provoked you to do that, considering that both of you are also first generation lawyers? How do, let's start with you. So Inglis. in fact, uh, I, my entry into law was only thanks to National Law School, getting into the, getting admission there and then, then law became an option. I wrote the exam because my friends were writing, but it was National Law School that, you know, really uh, gave you aspirations of becoming a lawyer and a practicing lawyer. But as far as I was concerned, I was a first generation lawyer. 
so my as you rightly said i went into corporate the, during campus recruitment i went into corporate i was working as a retainer with reliance's general counsel for two and a half years hmm. before uh, there after i got married my husband and i moved to delhi and then i chose litigation and i started off with indu malhotra when i wasn't very sure whether i would be able to make it as a litigating lawyer but thereafter that the sort of uh, exposure that i got in supreme court with indu ma'am uh, you know made me realize that dream which was always a dream but which had initially seemed unattainable if unless you were sort of rooted but mm. with national law school giving that sort of background and thereafter good mentors i think we could as i could take on the litigation how about you uttara so for me i decided i wanted to be a lawyer when i was in school and i remember telling my mom she was driving she just stopped her car where you know on just on the side and she was aghast because she had seen the you know the lawyers who are really more like notaries who sit under trees with their typewriter and she said you know you can't be sitting there with a the typewriter do you know and you know because i was a decent student i had science maths i said no this is really what i want to do so it was against a lot of opposition uh, but i have very supportive parents and uh, yes i think there are a lot of there is a lot of comfort in corporate law but i think i knew for me from from day one that the reason i became a lawyer was to be here in court and feel i think you just get a sense you're you're a part of the process where there is justice dispensation mm. and for me that was very close to my heart every single internship for me was in the courts either in trial courts or in appellate courts okay it, there was okay. absolutely no doubt in my head okay. and with stars in my eyes because i i didn't really realize how hard it was going to be uh, as it did prove to be but i think somehow we've all yeah all we'll talk definitely through. touch upon the hardships but a little bit later archana so you are the first person of course you come from a legal background in the sense you have family members who are in the legal profession but you became the first to come to delhi and practice in the supreme court why well to be very frank unlike the my other friends i had no intention to join law okay. not litigation and nothing <laughs> So uh, I got mar married when I was in my third year of LLB. So back in Rajasthan, I belong to Rajasthan, and there, uh, girls are married off early because you know that's the tradition. You have you can study, and my family was very very supportive. So the idea was that you be on your own, but you know marriage has to be side by side and quickly. So I got married when I was in third year. Then I I had my daughter immediately thereafter uh, after a year. and but my husband and my father they both were after me and my father told me very clearly i know my daughter you can't be satisfied anywhere else you have to be in litigation because i was after him that no i have to be in corporate because you know unlike the other youngsters i wanted to earn money so uh, but he told me no uh, this is where you have to be so and uh, we are not uh, i mean i i was very afraid of my father mm -hmm. so i was like okay just for his satisfaction let me go tell him that i couldn't do that so now let me do what i want to but uh, as soon as i landed up in supreme court i mean there was no looking back and i was ready to do whatever it could take to be to stand there and i i just used to admire uh, women there the advocates there and then there was no looking back my husband supported me throughout so whenever we we are talking about litigation and uh, litigating lawyers women lawyers it it can't be without support of uh, of your family and i'm sure my other uh, colleagues would agree to that mm -hmm. it is um, at least now the situation is that it's not that you have to choose between your family and your profession so litigating lawyers you also are taking care of your family your kids as well as the profession you can do both otherwise back in the early days it was like it's only you know women who are either not married or divorced right. or whatever yeah. but like you have to choose one yeah so in fact that's so, that aspect of flexibility which the yes. profession is i think offering but let's first talk about or touch upon the hardships all four of you have spent i think close to over two decades in in the profession you've been running around in the supreme court corridors i have seen some of you first running around with files with seniors now i'm seeing iPads. you and <laughs> now i'm seeing you running around with ipads and arguing very effectively in the court so have you ever found uh, hardship in the corridors of supreme court i want to start with you archana first 
No, I haven't. To be very, very uh, candid with you, I feel Supreme Court is the best place for a woman lawyer to be. I have, I have gone to other high courts as well. Uh, and there are things that I could never ever imagine that, you know, women lawyers are facing. Like I wouldn't name the one high court, but I went there to argue a case and that was a criminal matter. And there, when I went there in that courtroom, I was the only woman lawyer there. And I was told that uh, women lawyers don't uh, appear uh, for criminal matters here. And everybody was like, you know, uh, very startled, surprised. Oh, you've come from Delhi. And, you know, we were like, uh, as if there is something wrong with us. So everybody was like, and then, uh, you know, uh, the washrooms, there was no yeah. washroom there. You had to take the keys from one of the attendants and then she would go to uh, go with you and then come back. And that's how it was here in Supreme Court. Uh, the judges are, uh, you know, they hear you and you're not judged just because you're a woman lawyer. At least I don't have that experience. Mm -hmm. They've all been very supportive. They want to, and if you're making sense, look, you have to make sense when you're standing there. Yeah. You just can't argue. Yeah. So uh, there is no concession as such, but you have to speak to the point. You have to speak relevant and a uh, lot of appreciation, a lot of the, the seniors are very, very supportive. Right. How about you, Sarupma? Any, any event or any incident which you feel at any point of time in the Supreme Court made you feel uh, that you've taken a wrong decision? So, uh, when it comes to litigation, no, not at all. I was always like very much at home in the litigation. But when it comes to gender, I believe the place where in courtroom we are standing, it, it is gender neutral. I have never felt that I'm standing as a woman lawyer. I always feel like even I have objection of using even that woman lawyer and we don't call male lawyer. So, why woman lawyer? Advocate is the advocate. Yeah. So, in courtroom, I have never felt and uh, Supreme Court is definitely in that way the ideal place. Even in high courts, wherever I have appeared, I have not got sense of the gender issue and NCLT and CLT anywhere. But when it comes to bar, uh, Supreme Court bar was the first place where I got to experience gender bias or maybe gender perspective bias as such but perspective like you know the gender and i'll share the incidents i was preparing for my aor exam having coffee in uh, cafeteria and uh, some one just joined i mean I, I don't even remember the name and place and he said oh you're preparing for aor i said yes ha huh, that's good for women i just closed my book and i looked at him and i said can you explain me how it is bad for men I mean, mm. I do understand it is good for women and that's what for being me being first generation, of course, I wanted to clear because, you know, it will give me a place, a sense of being at place. But then how it is bad for men. Right. So, you know, that one incidence has definitely made me feel a bit, little conscious. But when it comes to working and performance, we have not faced any such issue. At least I haven't faced. So, which means there is no discrimination when it comes uh, to appearing in the court, when it comes no to... No concession, no discrimination. Right, right. <laughs> as far as the you bench just, is concerned. As Arjunaji rightly put, it is all about what you are talking. You have to make sense. You you just have to give them sub room to, you know, it is a constitutional court. Right. So right. you have to make sense to assist them. I mean, we all are assisting there to write a judgment and that's where uh, you are heard. Right. And not only gender, I think anything like face value, etc., which people talk, nothing exists, at least not in Supreme Court. Right. How about you? So, so yeah, I think uh, I would agree that by and large in Supreme Court, I haven't faced any sort of, you know, hostility because of, you know, of the fact of being a woman. But there are two points. One is that other than the Supreme Court, uh, there have been instances, so I recall an incident where I appeared before the National Consumer Commission and um, I was arguing it myself, whereas, you know, there was, he's, the, the presiding officer said, so when is your senior going to come? Mm -hmm. So the thing is that there was a presumption that as a woman who is not aged, who is mm -hmm. not elderly, I am not really leading the matter. So there is, number one, there is some sort of a stereotype. The second thing I felt is that ever since, I mean, when I joined the bar initially, I think it was totally equal. It's just your work. When you're a junior, you're assisting someone. But I think when you start off on your own, um, I think there is another dynamic of being a first generation lawyer because uh, work is really what gives you confidence. It's if you don't have too much work, we are professionals. Yeah. So that, you know, your quantity is important. So when you're a first generation lawyer, so, you know, added to being a woman, because I feel when I became an AOR, 
filing work came right they were comfortable because and in fact many of them actually prefer women because they assume we are more meticulous with our paperwork with our drafting uh but moving from there and moving beyond just putting the papers in order and drafting and moving on to a stage where you wanted to now take lead and present the matter exactly. in its entirety i think that is still a challenge and i think while most of the judges are extremely supportive the fact that we don't have as many women leading right as men i think shows that there are still some stumbling blocks i think that's all about perception i would uh, definitely talk about it uh, you know perception when it comes to uh, litigants so we'll yes. touch upon that as well liz you in turn i mean you started with uh, none other than indu manohtra ji who who was actually the first woman lawyer to get designated by the supreme court in the supreme court and then she went on to become the judge and a very big inspiration to all of us exactly yes, that's what i was going that to say that is a great yeah. privilege i've had yes so uh, of course you've been in a very positive company since the beginning and uh, but despite that uh, do you think you faced any sort of um, you know i mean i hardship i would like to say again any sort of hardship uh from the staff of the supreme court or from the registry you know in the manner uh, uh, of you know their perception frankly no i think by the time we had come with indu malhotra minakshi arora indra jaising there were many who had led from the front due to which by the time they that that difficulty or the hardship had been covered by them so we had i think new challenges and the challenges as you rightly point out is the level of confidence that we inspire in litigants mm. so even if we were very good as competent as lawyers there's always a perception that oh will she be able to stand up and argue as effectively and for me uh, my husband is my classmate and we are like we've had a journey together and as peers i see that you know during the initial years of his journey he was able to attract the confidence of a lot more uh, litigants common man who thought he could you know advocate much more powerfully than i could mm. so i think it took about 5 to 7 years for me to sort of catch up with that but thereafter i think we then once you or oh, once you once you start, sort of have that uh, clientele and all i feel you get it is easier for you as a woman to get noticed right so right. i think it is a challenge but it is also an opportunity right so as far and supreme court mm -hmm. i think is very uniquely placed in in as much as we have because of the people who have tread in front of us we have had i mean we've started at, at i mean we started without much hardship but in terms of this journey of being senior advocates or leading from the front that is still something that you know we can we can hopefully contribute to right so let's talk about from the litigants uh, perspective you know i mean as pointed out by liz have you ever faced any uh, such problem where a litigant is very reluctant to come to a woman lawyer and uh, you know make her lead a matter so um i have it could be on it could be for various reasons maybe yes, could be yes. for you know a mild demeanor uh, maybe could be uh, you know with the percep perception that probably she may not be able to be very vocal in the court it could be for various reasons may not necessarily that the woman is not as intelligent as a as a as a male lawyer so it it didn't put forward to me as like i was woman but i was referred few matters where uh, the person client who would come to me and the first question would be oh i trusted and i'm definitely sure you make the perfect draft because you have taught in law school you know that tag was always there that if you can teach there you would make a better draft but who will argue so you know the, my first response would be it's me and uh, there were situations so far nobody has gone bad because of that that's uh, i mean really mm -hmm. i would not say i faced discrimination or i was at loss but that but hesitation I can, i can still see the expression that okay you know yeah. the question would come who will lead and i would say until you want to do at that time i wasn't senior until you want to uh, pay for some senior it would be me who would be doing it so you know the because i did not have any uh, i have also always independent after my uh, training so there was no man sitting in the chamber they would look around and i'm talking about that individual client not the corporate houses 
I have got the uh, privilege of leading some of the houses and the corporate life and that client trust has a different meaning altogether. Mm. Mm. I would not name, but I was doing a matter with the, one of the statutory body and to law officer. I said, why do you want to engage senior in this matter? This is such a simple matter. I would do that. He said, it's not about me. If anybody can lose, he took name of a biggest lawyer. He said, even he can lose. I know that. But I want to engage a big person to just have my job saved tomorrow. CAG would not ask questions. <laughs> okay. why, why did you uh, made our AOR to argue? So, you know, I think this is where I think because that time, again, it wasn't about gender. Maybe it was not told to me in that way. Hmm. It was put differently. Yeah, in a but very subtle manner. I feel, let us see how it unfolds because now... I do have the senior designation and the gown, which he referred at that time. So, you know, in subtle indications, I think we all have got nobody would upfront to say, while I had a journey that I have already proved myself right. when I came to. If you come right after law graduation, the journey is different. When you come after proving yourself, coming from Gorakhpur, teaching in Analyst Bangalore and then coming back, the journey was my fight was different, different. than my other colleagues because in initial years, everybody would think, oh, poor girl, she has got relocated because of her husband, you know. Mm -hmm. They would not take me seriously that I'm here for profession. Rather, I had to defend my husband every time that, no, it was my decision. To come and join. I wanted to become a lawyer and it's, he has nothing to do with my <laughs> resignation. <laughs> I have something to add here. In fact, on this, uh, so when I was appointed standing counsel for state of Kerala, lawyers would call up my husband and say, so what's happening in that matter? And he'd say, uh, I'm not the standing counsel. She's the standing counsel. Please call her. So it took some time for yeah. people to recognize that, uh, you know, I was not just a figurehead and it was I who was really doing the work. <laughs> so that I think is one place where uh, people just assume that uh, though she's his standing counsel, he must be the one who's doing who's the Who's handling the matter. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly what happens in my state. Right. So even in politics, we have the women serpentes. You must have all heard about them. They are in this big gungat. And the husband is running the show. They are yeah. just there because that seat is reserved for women. Right. So husband cannot contest and he ca he cannot be there. So that's exactly what happens back at our at my home state. So how about you, Archana? How have you dealt with these kind of with such clients who have probably come up to you and you know expressed reluctance in you leading a matter? I, I have many such instances. So initially, when uh, a client, uh, I my name was referred and the client would come. So he would initially just come with the file to see how a woman lawyer looks like. Okay. Because in Rajasthan, uh, there are not many, many women lawyers back then who would be arguing. You would see them running behind a senior, taking Passovers, taking adjournments, but not arguing. In fact, it was very until very recently that we got our first woman judge who was directly elevated from the bar to the bench in Rajasthan High Court, I think almost after 70 years of independence. So uh, back at home, it was like they wanted to come and see how a woman lawyer looks like they would uh, keep the so the first uh, client that came to me he it was a criminal matter and it was this thick file with all the statements everything and he just kept that there and he said uh, when I started asking so in that uh, uh, you know Marwari language yeah. local language I, I started asking him questions and he just wanted to test how much I know so he said so it was it was that and then he said Aap aram se time le lo, main kal a jaunga, kal bata I said no you sit here I can see that it's not a very big uh, judgment I can uh, you know see and read and I can tell you what exactly it is so then he went back leaving the still the files there he went back he again consulted the lawyer who had given my name and he said yes you can trust her then he came back again and then he said okay you can do it but you draft it again send it to my local lawyer and once he approves then only, then only we will file so you know uh, the journey was like that and it happened it, it it went on for quite some years i won't say that that was the first case and i did great no and in fact uh, even uh, till today uh, they want to have uh, male lawyers because they think that they can attract more attention because they can be more effective yes, in the court effective. because of their uh, yeah yes of their i think maybe yeah, yeah yeah because that's what they have seen right from the beginning right from the trial court till the high court they have just seen that but when it comes to the supreme court 
uh, and once they have once they come and have a word then of course uh, they get it changes a bit so yes. uttara 2007 when the when uh, a single woman lawyer was designated as senior to 2023 rather 24, 24. 17 long, long years from so from 1 to 11 so in 17 years this is it's a gradual increase I must say so do you see the legal landscape changing when it comes to women lawyers yeah I think certainly because between seeing one leading now at least there will be many more of us because incrementally now if you add over the years it's I think around 23 or such and such a number 24. Yeah. So I think the more women are seen, the more it will inspire and I think it will normalize. It will normalize seeing women in a leadership role as opposed to always uh, seeing. So for instance, a senior counsel, you close your eyes, you see a grey haired, maybe slightly well built man, elderly. So I think once they visualize women, as seniors women, or when they stop visualizing a good quality lawyer as being a male, mm -hmm. I think to get there, they will have to see many more of us. So mm -hmm. I think it's still not a very large number. My husband is not a lawyer. He's a professor. So when he read the headlines and said, oh, history, you know, he said, that's it. 11 out of 55 is that's only <laughs> one fifth. But I said that, no, historically, if you see it's substantial. Yeah. So I think till we get there, like, Justice Ginsburg had said that when all nine judges on the Supreme Court are women, right, that's, that's right. when there will be enough women. Hmm. So I think just seeing a lot of women will have a great impact. But I think also to, to treat us only as women lawyers will probably be counterproductive because the assumption will be that we made it because we are women. So is this actually the, you know, breaking the glass ceiling moment, Liz? I would think so. It, uh, in terms of, is uh, I think in the corporate world you talk about a Cyril, uh, the yeah. Amarchand Zia had already broken this uh, glass ceiling. Yeah. In litigation, if you even now the if you talk about the first top five uh, best counsels in India, that would I don't know whether it yeah. would be arguable. Right. That, you know, that, that we have uh, confident young women coming into the profession, I think is the beginning of the breaking of the glass ceiling. How do you One see it? One of us is definitely going to make it in that top five soon. It is just beginning of that. Archana, is this the I, Yes, I, I have similar sentiments. I share it. Okay, so before I end this, I mean, wonderful, fruitful discussion, I would like to touch upon a very controversial uh, issue which is about the pay gaps when it comes to paying a woman lawyer and a male lawyer. I'm, of course, the question is for each one of you and I want to know very honestly, have you ever faced this kind of a problem? Please, you start. Absolutely. I think that is something we have to work on because even in terms of what you command for yourself, hmm. when I quote a fee, I instinctively ask my husband who quotes double the fee instinctively and then we moderate. So I, I don't know where it comes from. Yeah. But there is, uh, I think that in terms of, I, 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 I think it's also personalities because I feel that, you know, I want to be paid only for the effort that I put in on all. While I think, uh, you know, it, uh, others so, so have a certain... Is it all certain... about demanding or is it about how much the client wants to pay? I think it is about the confidence to demand. Yeah. Very often the client will possibly pay, but the confidence to demand, I think, till now for women has been lower. So, Yes, so I do feel that this is like a chicken egg thing. I think the fact that women uh, don't raise very high fees is because they probably feel it will not get cleared or accepted or they may lose the matter. So for many of us who's, who have had, who for whom it hasn't been a bed of roses, you probably feel, okay, let me retain the matter. Maybe I lose a little money. So mm -hmm. I think there is, there is a little bit of that. I think we undersell ourselves. Uh, maybe because we, it, everything has come at a cost and we don't want to lose it very easily. But I think at some point, hopefully in the near future, I think if we can command, because I think a lot of this is what the price you put on your own worth. So the moment you start believing you are equal 
to that person who the only difference is that he is a male your yeah. same seniority so i think that belief has to come that from within us that realization has to be and i hope be. it happens soon yeah so my experience is little different since i don't have any one in my uh, at, at homes to know the difference uh, i'll just put uh, one more point here my husband is not from my profession mm. and from 12 years from the time i came after my resignation we are still working on my causeless versus his duty roster and we every month we start with that every day is a fresh day with that perspective so i was always very clear i don't undersell myself and it's not about only demanding i feel i deserve that hmm. i do i'm okay for not taking anything and going forward and why i mentioned my husband because i always had this feeling from the beginning i have home i don't need to pay rent for it i have everything at home if i get it's fine if i don't i don't i'll if somebody is needy i would go pro bono but if it's about payment yes what i deserve i must get it so i was very particular and uh, i do fairly quote and i have been getting it so far yeah i don't know less or more because i don't have anybody at home to compare <laughs> that way <laughs> yes archana since so, you come from a lawyer's family so so uh, for me it has been different for me work was always a priority i always wanted to have enough work i never cared about what i'm getting mm -hmm. even if it was like underselling myself it was fine mm -hmm. i wanted to have more and more work so that i could have more and more experience because uh, my father told me initially one very uh, important thing to keep in mind that in litigation it's not the money which counts money will keep it will come after you mm -hmm. but provided you uh, do the good work so i always had that thing in my mind that i have to be visible there at the front i have to be arguing and then people are going to come to me mm -hmm. so i absolutely for the first 5 years i never demanded anything uh in rajasthan we don't have a very good fee structure they are very poor people when it comes to criminal matters i was fine i i never asked whatever they gave it's fine i wanted to have work so i was very clear my husband was supporting me financially throughout mm -hmm. so like she yeah. said i had a, a house i had everything yeah. so what and he told me that you just concentrate on on your work and my father told him very clearly L give her some time and you know uh, it will it will come back so that was my story i i never demanded I something to it very interesting one so my husband is cardiologist and uh, at one stage like i always had that i don't want to run after money my father told once if you don't chase money money chases you and that's what has happened hmm. to me hmm. so one fine day i just gone to office and i came back again without demanding also i was fairly paid in that way so i came after hardly half an hour and i had packet in my hand which was fairly good amount and he was like if i knew this why why i studied wow. medical <laughs> people when they come to well fighting with life and death <laughs> if you quote a good fee good fee means 2000 3000 consultation <laughs> fee people would say oh doctor is very expensive <laughs> and i never knew law is like you know this so yeah. you know we all have different experience but as uh, i think we all will agree to one part that we have travel from the situation where law was not good for women exactly and now the you can have both good words like your no where i think law is now women. becoming a first option exactly. for women so yeah. here i will add something with my law school experience again in the hostel they have been from in law school the admission at in the year i was without women reservation was more than 50% girls have made it on merits through entrance exam and hostel capacity for men were so much that even building was empty but for girls we had to make them in small small room three girls four girls yeah. like that so you know at the time when law school was made hardly 30 years ago perhaps the impression the idea was perhaps less women will come right from that till getting more than 50% on merits without reservation girls we have traveled far right where i see the problem women come but the drop out is a lot that's right and that's where i feel whether it's bar council or wherever something is definitely required but that's but, but that's in litigation yes. the yes. drop out yes. is there that in the litigation but i guess it's not in the, yeah not no, no, in the no, corporate or uh, you know, no, 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 missing no. middle they call yeah. it yeah. missing, missing middle and that yeah. is across so that that's where the problem is women come women do perform wherever and if you just see at any court like we have seen if most of the courts have very less women lawyers but if you see somebody could sustain everybody has performed, right. has performed and everybody is performing i think it's all about also the institutional support which yes. is now increasing uh, yes. as we have seen over the years i mean the kind of changes that have actually come about post covid 
you know, online hearings, hybrid hearings, making it even more flexible for women lawyers to come and argue the matter. Well, anyways, with this note, I thank all four of you for joining us today. Uh, and I hope our viewers enjoyed, uh, you know, after hearing from their inspirational journeys and how they have actually made it through uh, to this historic moment. Thank you so much for joining me today and thank you so much viewers thank for you. joining us. Thank, thank you. you.